we start, I want to get a deal out of the crowd. How many of you guys are gamers? Raise your hand if you're a gamer. All right, all right. So who all came here today because they went extra credit for class or their professor who paid them? You raise that? All right, all right. No judgment. Um, you know, as I actually plan these talks, I think about all the bad academic talks I had to sit through in college. So I will try to keep it super uh, energetic and interesting. So. Um, you know, uh, my name is Brianna Wu. I'm the head of development at Giant Space Cat. Uh, we kind of specialize in making cinematic games. Um, and you know, like uh, she said, I've kind of been at the center of a mini controversy for the last seven months now. Um, before I start my talk, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, last night when I was giving another speech in this room, we kind of had we had a very uncomfortable incident with someone that kind of disrupted the talk about with some pretty aggressive questions. Um, there's the children's table, and there's the adult's table. This is the adult's table. So if you want to have a conversation, you don't have to agree with everything I say, but we do have to act like an adult. So let's just keep that in mind as we're going today. Um, so like I said, uh, I run a video game studio, Giant Space Cat. Um, we develop very cinematic games using the Unreal Engine, one of the biggest experts in the entire world in mobile Unreal. Uh, I specifically specialize in cinematic scripting, which means making story events for games. So uh, I guess what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start and we're gonna show you a trailer for our first game that we released last year. This is Revolution 60, and I'm just gonna play it. Men, my friends aren't dying. It would do a lot for my morale if I understood what they were dying for. This is the mission briefing I received before we got set up. Your mission is to infiltrate N3 on 3, arm the faith, and pass control to just If you fail this mission, it will mean an all out new world. And if representation of women in games. Um, I think anyone that's not a gamer can look at video games and tell they, they kind of don't represent women the best way sometimes. We tend to be 
over-sexualized sex objects, you know, bimbos, dams damsels in distress. And you know, I remember playing video games in the 80s and being so frustrated that there were so few women to play as. Uh, you know, Super Mario 2, you got to play as Princess Peach. Uh, Metroid, you, know, you got to play as Samus. But, you know, it feels like, it feels like very generally speaking, women, you barely ever get to play as a woman in video games, and which is not represented very well. So, you know, my mission when I launched my game company, it was, it was pretty simple. I wanted to make games that were friendlier to women. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really interesting things that have happened in video games since 2008. They did a study in 1989 and showed that in 1989, only 3% of gamers were women. 3%! Um, you know, we kind of slowly grew as a percentage of the gaming populace. Um, as recently as 2008, if I'm remembering correctly, we were 11% of gamers in that year. Um, you know, now in 2015, since the advent of the iPhone, you know, we're actually up to 49% of gamers. And, you know, it's not complicated. Like, we finally gave people a place to get in on the ground floor of being gamers that doesn't require you to like hold a controller with 15 buttons and dual joysticks to just get around. So it kind of gave what I call neo gamers a place on the ground floor to kind of get used to video games and enjoy them. And you know, what's happened since then is we've had an explosion in the number of women that are gamers. That said, when I look at the iOS market, you know, a, a market that's typically friendlier for women gamers, um, it's not game types that I personally am interested in. And I believe that women want deeper gameplay than just match three gems, you know, um, like Candy Crush. So what we are doing at Giant Space Cat is we kind of, we're asking ourselves what are women interested in playing. And one of the really cool things about colleges is they fund women's studies departments that do all kinds of science. And you can go read their papers for free and actually find out scientifically what women gamers are actually interested in. And the answers are things like better representation. Um, I call it the Maddie Myers test. It's not a problem if a woman is sexualized. The problem is if she's represented as a person. Like, so what women scientifically are looking for from games is emotional connections with the characters, narratives. We typically don't care about scoring. We're typically turned off by excessive blood and violence. Uh, again, this is just very generally speaking. So, um, you yeah, know, for me, as a cold-hearted capitalist, I just wanted to start a company to kind of address this market. And this is what uh, is called the Blue Ocean Strategy. This is something from, um, it's actually a Japanese management philosophy. And the idea behind it is there are red oceans and there are blue oceans. Red oceans are things that are already fished out. They're markets that we already know make money, that people will buy games in those markets. Uh, so an example would be Call of Duty, first-person shooters. This is a red ocean. If you want to make that game, you know there's a market for it. It's locked in. If you want to make an Assassin's Creed game with a third-person, behind-the-back, go-murder-everything game, we know there's a market for that. So, you know, the basic idea here, you have red oceans and you have blue oceans. When Nintendo brought the Wii to the market, um, you know, many gamers, myself included, thought it was going to fail. You know, we called it waggle control because you would be saying you're doing this. But the truth is, this was fishing in a market that we had never really seen before. And, you know, the Wii was a massively profitable system. So what Giant Space Cat is basically doing is we're saying, look, I can't go compete with first-person shooters. I have no idea how to make that. I don't play them myself. I can never make a MOBA. I can never make a Dota. Um, but I can make a really cool narrative-based game that makes different choices. So that's where we are going as a company. Um, Revolution 60 was a massive success. We did very well financially. Um, we won four different Game of the Year awards, which is very exciting. And this is the first game that our company put out. So to kind of make that level of quality of their first time out of the gate, um, you know, we, we did very well. And I think it really speaks to how many people um, are excited in the mission that we're doing. Uh, Revolution 60 has 24 different endings. It was amazing to me that I would get letters from people that would play through the game constantly, over and over and over again, trying to figure out the math to get every single one of those 24 endings. So, you yeah, know, very interesting. And like I said, our, um, our reviews were really excellent. 
uh, you know, Serena Caldwell over at Macworld. Um, you know, she said it was one of the most ambitious games she played all year. Uh, game Breaker gave me one of my favorite quotes. This is the next evolution of mobile games. Uh, how many people out there played Final Fantasy VIII? Anybody? All right. All right, we should hang out and talk after this. Uh, you know, this is one that you do quotes from Game Breaker that I really appreciate. My first aha moment in gaming was when I played Final Fantasy VIII. You know, I basically lost all track of time and I couldn't wait to find out what happened next in the story. Mobile gaming is kind of exist in the same state. Um, they're mobile games, but they barely have a story and you're just kind of going along. Revolution 60 is pushing mobile gaming to the next level and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. A side note with this, one thing I think is very, very interesting, if you look at the Rep60 reviews, I actually did a spreadsheet and I looked at what women reviewers said about our games and how they rated us versus how the men rated us. And there was a huge differential of like 2.4 points on a 10 point scale between them. So I think that's getting into other biases we'll talk about. But basically there are people that are strongly responding to what we're doing. So what happens when you lead a, um, when a well-known tech feminist kind of leads a studio and puts out a game with a lot of feminist vibes that wins awards and gets a lot of press? Um, what's, what's the response? It's blind spree and panic. We got a ridiculous amount of pushback, a ridiculous amount of pushback. This is even before all this Gamergate stuff of people like yelling at my game, calling it action event the game, you know, blasting at UTEs, attacking my character models. And by the way, this is just a side note. Something people criticize my game for constantly is saying, oh, your characters look like rat dogs. And I want to tell you, if you were out there and you're attacking a game because it looks like a popular toy for young girls, like that's kind of a sexist statement. Like you're kind of, I think we have that in uh, games a lot, where there's anything that teenage girls like, we kind of put down or insult to them. It's really uncool. So, you know, we basically have people that felt very threatened by the work we were doing. And, um, you know, immediately from the word go, I started getting rape threats and all kinds of other harassment just for being in this industry in the first place. Oh, sorry. You know, so the truth is right now, games are changing. This is a really good thing. Um, how many people out there have a PS4 or an Xbox One? Raise your hand. So, I want to ask you a question. Are you, are you... Like the, the kids do. The kids do. Okay, so who actually plays one? Are you happy with the PS4 right now? I have Xbox One. Xbox One? Yeah. Are you, are you happy with this generation of games? Personally, yes. Really? Okay. I have to say, for me, as someone who's a lifelong gamer, I have all systems. And what I see with this generation is less innovation happening than any other generation of game I've seen before this. You know, the Super Nintendo was a big evolution on the Nintendo. The GameCube was a big evolution on, you know, the Super Nintendo, basically. And, well, or the N64. And what I see is an industry that's really stagnant. And I think the PS4 and Xbox One really signify this. We have more processor power. And what are we doing with that extra processor power? Well, we're upping our texture resolution from 1K to 2K in some points, you know, in 2K to 4K in some extreme cases. So you have prettier textures that you can barely tell on a 1080 TV. You have more particle effects. You have some fluid dynamic sheets with uh, programmable shaders. So to me, I look at the game industry right now, and just as a technologist, I see an industry that's really stagnant and is out of ideas. Um, on the other side, you have new game developers. Every one of the games here are developed by women. Um, so you have my game, obviously, but this is uh, Cameron Kingdom. This is by a woman I think is a genius. Her name is Jenna Hofstein. Um, she's basically a genius at creating a camera. So she looked at educational games and said, hey, education games suck. Let's figure out how to make them fun. And she did with Cameron Kingdom, which is a award-winning game. Zoe didn't do Brave herself. This is Zoe Quinn. She's another Boston game developer. But, you know, it's basically narrative as a design choice. And again, it's not a game where you're going through and murdering people, but it's, it's something that's very story-based. And I have to tell you, as a gamer, I play this stuff, and this is a lot more interesting. So, you know, I think that it's a big market. We have all kinds of games there. So before 
before I kind of move into gamer day, I want to be really clear with you guys. I would rather talk about anything else. Anything else. You know, I'm an engineer. I'm a software nerd. I would rather talk about Unreal, Maya versus Max, ZBrush pipelines, retopology passes, decimation, EDs, anything besides gamer day. Um, when I first started my career back in 2010, I will never forget this, talking to the best man at my uh, wedding before I got married. And we were talking about Jessica. And I actually said to him, I said, you know, I just think feminism is not really something you need to bring into your work all the time. I think if you just do good work, you're going to be fine. Um, and then I launched my company and kind of moved from general engineering over to game engineering. And it was by far the most sexist industry I have ever worked in, to the point where my jaw drops some days. I have had meetings with publishers where they've spent the entire time, men have had business meetings with, have spent the entire time leering sexually at the women in my company, which is kind of an uncomfortable way to have a business meeting. Um, I have had meetings with one of the big three game makers where they've talked about my work as a feminist and laughed in my face about it at a business meeting with a big multi-billion dollar company. You know, so when we're talking about this stuff, this is literally a question women get to participate in software engineering. Because right now it is a really horrible place for us. And you know, don't listen to my opinion, just look at the science of it. Uh, women end up leaving technology at over three times the rate that men do. And if you think about it, it's like we have this pipeline. You know, engineers talk a lot about pipelines. So you have people at the beginning of the pipelines when you know girls are very young and they're kind of steered away from computers to other things. And you know, then you're in high school and it's the same thing. Like socially you're pushed in this direction, and it's more socially acceptable for you know, teenage boys to basically work on computers. And then you get to college and there's pressure to show you the door. And then, like, let's say you make it through college. So you become a software engineer and you go get your first job. I cannot tell you how many you know, women I know in their early 20s have gotten their first job. And they get out there and the men start treating them as sex options slash people to date versus taking them seriously as professionals. Which is very frustrating. I know a lot of women have had sexual harassment incidents. You go beyond that. The same thing in your 30s. You know, a lot of women start having children in their 30s. Um, I think the pressure against women as parents is one of the biggest problems we do not talk about in this industry. I know more women that have left uh, game development after they've had children than anything else. So, you know, when we're talking about feminism in this context, this is literally a question if women get to be sitting alongside men developing the future. And, you know, something I talk about a lot is I think we all know that Twitter, I think we all know that Facebook, I think we all know that Reddit, I think we all know that a lot of these communities online are not safe places for women. If you're out there and you've ever played an MMO, you know what happens. You know the aggression and the harassment that you get. And I look at that and I have to say this because women are not helping engineer these products. You know, these are products designed by men for men. And it shows with the way they don't understand certain considerations. Um, let me give you an example. Our game Revolution 6 was released on Steam Greenlight. Um, we got unprecedented harassment to the point the press is talking about the amount of harassment our studio is getting. On Steam, one of the most important professional platforms in the entire world. And, you know, I talk to Steam and they go, hey, this is an open development platform. That's just the problem with it. Like, you're just going to have to deal with the harassment. And, you know, it shows. Like, the priorities of the people making the product shows. So I think it's really important to get women as engineers. So getting into Gamergate, this is going to be a very long, sad story. Um, so I'm going to kind of run you guys through Gamergate and the events leading up to it. Um, so where did Gamergate start? Um, kind of one of the, the common beliefs about Gamergate is it started with Zoe Quinn. Uh, but 
I personally, as someone that is very familiar with this incident, I don't think it started with Zoe Clue. I think feminism is kind of a flashpoint and a war zone in our industry. Started with Amoeba Sarkeesian launching Feminist Frequency in 2012. So what happened with this? Amoeba Sarkeesian is someone with, uh, I think she has a master's degree in uh, women's studies. And you know, she comes out and she just wants to launch a Kickstarter so she can do a feminist analysis, feminist analysis of video games. And um, you know, people react the same way they react to our company. Blind screaming panic. Um, you know, people are saying, oh, I'm worried she's just going to attack video games, she's not a gamer. And they respond in the most obnoxious ways you can ever imagine. They threaten to rape her, they threaten to murder her, they actually code video games. Professionals, professional men in our industry whose job it is to produce games actually went through and produced games where you take Anita Sarkeesian and you beat the crap out of her. And it's like, punch her with the mouse and then you see her face bloody up. Do you know how disgusting and disturbing that is? You know, it's like, it's like you have these people that were afraid their culture was under attack. And you know, feminist frequency launching in 2012 just started it all. So this kind of slow war against women in the field, um, it kind of was boiling all during 2014. Um, the woman in the slide is about has asked me to kind of stop talking about it because she receives so much harassment when she gets mentioned in newspapers these days. So just talking about this very generally. Um, something, there was a major incident in the video game industry in 2014 of this year. So there's a woman who is a friend of mine who is a well-known feminist writer, feminist game journalist. And um, she writes a critique of a company called Giant Bomb. Giant Bomb, if you're looking for bro game journalism, Giant Bomb is where you want to go. Um, it's basically a bunch of dudes that sit around talking about how much they love games all day. And it's one of the most uh, popular sites on the internet. There's nothing wrong with producing that kind of journalism. But what the problem is, is Giant Bomb very willfully and deliberately only hires a certain kind of gamer. So if you want to hear from women, don't go to Giant Bomb because they choose not to hire women. If you want to hear from black people, don't go to Giant Bomb because they choose not to hire them. If you want to hear from gay people, don't go to Giant Bomb because they choose not to hire them. And Giant Bomb kind of had a job open. And yet again, they, choose, they chose to go with someone who was a straight, white, you know, cisgendered man. And, you know, Samantha is, a, I'm sorry, this person was a, a game journalist, and she chooses to write a tweet critiquing this choice. And what happened? They started to run the same playbook on Samantha that they ran on, oh, they ran the same playbook on this person that they ran on um, Amina Sarkeesian. So, you know, she starts getting death threats. She starts getting rape threats. They start threatening to run her out of the industry. They start harassing her on Twitter nonstop. It's this playbook of making the cost of staying in the industry so high by intimidating and bullying you to the point that you just quit. And this person just simply had enough. And she said, there are easier ways to make a living. And she just left the field. And because of that, our industry lost one of our best and brightest voices. You know, this is where I want to kind of talk more about the personal cost of this. Because after that happened with this person, um, you know, what happened after that was the Zoe Quinn incident in August. So what happened with Zoe Quinn, I would call this one of the most disturbing things that's ever happened in our entire industry. And this is where Gamergate kind of formally gets its name. So Zoe Quinn is a Boston game developer. Um, I also live in Boston, so we know each other professionally. And you know, Zoe was a bit of a celebrity in the industry before this. She's very famous for having released Depression Quest. So if you want kind of a, a quirky, fun, idealistic, indie game developer, you want Zoe Quinn. Um, her game, Depression Quest, has been downloaded by over a million people. It's helped over a million people understand their depression. And, you know, she has had people tweeting her for years, saying, like, you're not going to get depression, just go lie down in the middle of the street and people will get you over your depression. 
like horrible, horrible stuff like that. And so what happens with Zoe Quinn is she has a former boyfriend of hers um, basically do what I would call the most sexist incident in the entire history of video games. Uh, they decided to destroy Zoe Quinn for entertainment. So I want you to imagine any woman out there in the audience today, I want you to imagine an ex-boyfriend of yours making a solid decision to destroy you professionally, to make a choice to destroy you professionally. So what her POS boyfriend does is gets everything they've ever said to each other through Skype, through Facebook Messenger, online, through text messages, every bit of it. And he releases it out in this blog, alleging the most horrible stuff about her sex life. And none of it is substantiated. I don't know if this is true, it's just hearsay. It's coming from someone, even if it doesn't, even if it were all true, every word of it. What Zoe Quinn chooses to do in her private life is her business. It doesn't have anything to do with anyone. It's the double standard that she's held to. So what ends up happening is Zoe Quinn is basically you have people going through her sex life, judging her on her sex life. And then you have POSs like Adam Baldwin, the jerk from Firefly, basically making, basically promoting videos like this one. This is a 25 minute video of stuff just accusing Zoe, slut shaming her, attacking her in the most vicious, libelous, slanderous way she can imagine. Like, imagine that. If you're a professional in the field, someone makes a 25-minute video about your sex life, and then you have, you know, people with, how many followers does that involve now? I think it's like 400,000 people watching this. And the idea is just to attack her as entertainment. When this happened, uh, it was actually during Pax Prime. Do you realize we had to bring out security at Pax Prime because sexist gamers were having t-shirts made called like Five Guys with the idea that Zoe had sex with five men and they were wearing that to her panels to slut shame her at that? You know, it's just beyond sexist double standards that she was held to. So, you know, Zoe does this, and she's barely hanging on. Like, this is someone that made a game about depression, famously. She suffers from depression. You know, people attacking her, her life privately over that. What happens afterwards? They start going after my friends, women I deeply care about in this field, one by one by one by one. This is Jack Frank. She's a very famous game dev journalist. She did a piece from Guardian on Gamer Game. What did they do to the Jennifer? They ran to play with her. So they go through her entire life, dig up dirt, dig up dirt, dig up dirt, dig up dirt, scream about it on Twitter until they find something they can attack her with. So they start discrediting her professionally, they start threatening her on Twitter, they threaten to rape her, you know, they start attacking her. They harass her until the point is, why am I doing this job? I don't need this. Jennifer quits. Maddie Bryce, one of the few, you know, black women journalists in our field. What happens to her? The exact same thing. They go through her life, they find something to attack her with. They cause controversy. Churn, 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 churn. Hate, 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 hate all day long until the woman just goes, F it, I'm out. There is your way to earn a living. Maddie Bryce is out. Lee Alexander, probably the most famous woman journalist in our entire field. They do the playbook on her. She didn't quit, but she sure just stepped away from things for a while. And I can tell you, I've been following her for a while. Gamergate changed her. Catherine Cross is one of my dearest friends. I adore this woman. She's an academic. You know, she's seen her friends attacked one by one. Do the exact same thing. The playbook. They threaten her, they attack her. You know, she, she bravely stood up with them. But what I want for you guys to imagine. I really want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine you've worked your whole life and you have your dream job. Something you've worked for your entire life. And in one of the most sexist fields in the entire world. Do you know, all of these women here, I love these women. I deeply care about them. So I want for you to imagine seeing the people you care about professionally, that you respect, picked off one by one by one. And I want for you to imagine on top of that, that 
game journalism is choosing to say nothing about it. It's just like, we don't want to get involved. It's not our problem. Who cares? Think about this. You know, one of the biggest problems with game journalism is they choose not to hire money. Game Informer is one of the most important institutions in game journalism. Do you know how many editors they have in uh, Game Informer that are women? They have 18 people classified as editors, meaning they choose news stories that they do. 17 of 18 of the editors at Game Informer are men. I want to say that one more time, one of the most important institutions in our entire industry, Game Informer, 17 out of 18 of their editors are men. So the truth is, if you're a woman, we don't have women running the show when it comes to journalistic oversight in our field, because no one hires them. And when they do hire us, we don't get to senior positions. This is a real problem. This is a quote from a friend of mine uh, from this time period on Facebook. I'm blocking her name out. Um, this is what she said. This is in October 10th of last year. We are not winning game of game. If we do win, it will be a pure victory. And what had happened at this point is we had lost so many women in this field, and nothing was happening. Intel was bowing out to pressure from us, you know, Gamer Gates to revoke their ads from um, Lee Alexander Sycom at the time of the Sutra. And we were just absolutely getting our ads kicked. So, yeah, then they decided to go after me. I have a show on 5x5, it's called Isometric. It's a game development show. Um, and I watched this podcast for one reason. I was really pissed that there weren't women who got to have opinions about video games professionally. If you listen to the Giant Bombcast, all dudes. Listen to IGN's podcast, pretty much all dudes. And what I wanted to do was just create some media where women could have a chance to have an opinion. So I did that. So Startup by Symmetric, it's a smash hit show. And again, this isn't complicated. It's like there are people out there that want to hear from different perspectives. So you create that media and then people come to it. So we launch Isometric. Um, I had been tweeting about Game of Game, even though I hadn't really been attacked in the same way. Um, other people have. And one of the fans of my show basically took some of the things I tweeted and turned them into memes and sent them to me. And my reaction was, that's hilarious, and I laughed, and I tweeted this out from my account. Back then, I only had 10,000 Twitter followers, so you know, I didn't think it would be a really big deal. And this is where it got really bad for me. Um, so what happened as soon as I tweeted that out, a site called 8chan started targeting me the same way that they targeted Jen Frank or, you know, Matty Price or any of my other friends. And, you know, what's really scary about 8chan is it's a site that's even more extremist than 4chan. I'm sure everybody out there knows 4chan. You know, there's only one thing you cannot post at uh, 4chan and this child pornography. <laughs> And then, like, Gamergate got so serious that they actually banned Gamergate discussions, too. So, you know, two things are illegal at 4chan, child pornography and talking about Gamergate, because that's how they behave. Um, so basically, this extremist faction of 4chaners leaves the site and moves over to a site called 8chan. Hardcore doxing, they host child pornography on the site. Um, you know, they dox people, they actually doxed a federal judge a few weeks ago. And um, so HN starts targeting. And I see them running the same playbook on me. I actually log onto their message board watching it. And, you know, they're going through my life, finding stuff to attack me about, whipping up the mom to a frenzy. And, you know, this is the moment where I just, it was on Thursday, and I just closed my MacBook and then walked away. And, I just said, guys, I'm taking a Twitter break. And this is a really difficult 24 hours for me because I'm going, am I going to stay in game development? Is this worth it? Do I want to get the same kind of BS happening to me that this just happened to Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian? Am I willing to go through this? 
Yeah, I wasn't sure. And I closed my MacBook and I walked away for 24 hours. And I really thought about what I was going to do. And, you know, this is the moment that I really had to show my character. And thought about it. And I said, they're not going to do me what they've done to my friends. And this has to stop somewhere. So I came back and I said, fuck you. I'm not going anywhere. This is my industry. I love making video games. And I'm not scared of you. So what happened after that? This came about two minutes after I posted that. Guess what, bitch? I know where you live. You and your husband live at, and you post my address out there. I'm going to rape your filthy ass until you bleed and choke you to death with your husband's tiny Asian penis. Your mutilated corpse will be on the front page of Jezebel tomorrow. There isn't jack shit you can do about it. If you have any kids, they're going to die too. I hope you enjoy your last moments in life longer. And this scared the shit out of me. But I had so much of women being silent about what happened to us that I just said, screw it, and I tweeted this out from my account. It went mega viral. Um, Will Wheaton tweeted this out to show people, and from there it just exploded. So that's when the, and by the way, I also had to leave my house because of those death threats. Like that's pretty specific and actionable. So the question I get a lot is why I chose to speak up about all the death threats I was getting. Because it wasn't just that one, they started rolling in constantly. So why did I choose to speak up about this? Again, it was our industry was not getting it done. IGN, Giant Bomb, Game Informer, we're all choosing to say nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing about this. See no evil, hear no evil. The male editors are revealed just decided never it wasn't a story. And I was really pissed. And I said, fine, if our industry isn't going to get it done, I'm going to find somebody with them. I went on MSNBC, CNN, PBS, the BBC, I did like five times, NPR, Guardian, Wall Street Journal. You did media, I went into it. If you look at my MSNBC appearance, I am a wretch. I was so psychologically affected by what happened. How could I not be? I had to flee my house because I thought I was going to be murdered. So you see me on this tape and my hair is stringing and my eyes are bloodshot and I'm barely holding it together. The reason I said yes is because we had to make people aware of this crap. And I pushed through and I did raise awareness of this. What happened in the months after this is I forced all of those game publications to finally address this because all the rest of the press was going, why are you guys saying nothing? So right after I did this media firestorm, what happened? You know, um, Polygon ended up denouncing it, Game Informer ended up denouncing it, IGN ended up denouncing it, and Giant Mom ended up denouncing Game of Game. And I finally got the industry to admit there was a problem. And you know, it was multifactorial. I did not win this fight myself, but I sure let the war be turning around. I think there's a real, this is a point where we need to ask ourselves a question about video games. You know, is it the culture of the play? What is the real problem in this field? It's very popular to say the real problem with games is, you know, this is just a few bad apples doing something that's wrong. I don't believe that's the truth. I think people respond to the environment that they, that they live in. And I think the problem with gamer culture is for so long, for 30 years now, this very specific gamer has been told in the center of the entire universe and everything caters to them. The Nintendo in 1985 made a very specific choice to market games specifically to boys between 10 and 15. And what you have because of that is this culture that grew up of women primarily being sex objects, damsels in distress, you know, over-sexualized bimbos for a player that is assumed to be male. And I don't have to tell you guys this, if you play video games, you know how women are represented. It's very problematic. So my belief is someone that's in this industry professionally, that writes about this profession, that, you know, is a developer at a professional level, <coughs> that works with companies at a professional level. My belief is the culture is set from the top, top down. So you have EA, you have Activision, you have all these companies that choose to make these games with ridiculously sexist overtones. 
that treat women as you know, afterthoughts. Look at Assassin's Creed. You know, the only way you can really even see women in this universe is when you pay sex workers to go distract people for you. That's how women are represented. And this is the toxic suit that we're living in. So you have bro game developers developing these very sexist games. You have bro game journalists kind of reviewing these very sexist games, being blind to all the problem. And then you have the players sitting here playing these games. And of course they're going to be sexist in ways they don't understand. Like they've been swimming in this suit for 30 years now. So, you know, I don't blame Gamergate for, I don't blame Gamergaters for what's happened. I mean, Gamergate is a symptom. I think the disease is an industry that is ridiculously sexist. So this is a video that I got. Um, you know, I've had 49 death threats now in the last six, seven months. And um, so I can't comment on this because this case is being adjudicated right now. Um, but I want to, just to show you guys what I go through emotionally. This is a video that was sent to me. Um, what happened earlier this day, before I got this video, is the person here basically leaked messages that made me, he said he was coming to my house with firearms to shoot me. So, um, basically I had talked to the police twice, and then this person sends me this video. So I want you to imagine what it's like to get this video. Episode about me. 
Um, this is the Law and Order produces a um, a episode about Hammergate, the character of this an amalgamation of Main Zone Quinn and Nina Sarkeesian. Um, but the best thing I can say about this episode is I think if you have to be on Law and Order, I think this is the best way I could have been on Law and Order. Like I'm still alive and I'm not accused of a crime, so um, that's great. But it's very, very surreal to see you know, the actresses of Law and Order read out your specific death threats and to see a character based on you do exactly what you did. Um, which gets us into like the suffering of women as entertainment, but that's a whole different subject. So, you know, kind of tying this up because I want to have time for some questions. Like, you know, something I'm accused of a lot is stepping in the game with me for publicity for my company. And I want to tell you guys, so Game of Thrones has been horrible for Giant Space Cat. It's delayed uh, progress on our game. Um, you know, I deal with the police at least one to two days a week. Um, you know, it's just been a huge time suck. So I want to talk to you guys honestly about what has happened to me because of this. Um, something people accuse me of a lot is I did this to help Revolution 60 sales. I'll tell you guys completely honestly, it barely affected Revolution 60 sales. Uh, it's maybe not just a few extra dollars a day, but it was negligible overall. It was like here before, and it moved up to about there. So, you know, it doesn't really affect us that way. Um, so that's just it's simply not true. One of the biggest time sucks for me personally is working with prosecutions. Um, taking a step back, I want to be really clear. Um, with me being at the center of this and getting so many death threats, I have a newfound respect for law enforcement. It is draining for me to get you like to walk around in public and worry I'm going to get killed. Um, this is what law enforcement does every day. I can't even imagine the psychic costs that that takes. On them. So you know, I want to be really clear here. I'm not trying to attack police when I'm talking about my experience with getting these cases adjudicated. But I also want to be really honest with you. In between me and Sir Casey and Zoe Quinn and me, we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of death threats. There's not been any prosecution, no misdemeanors, nothing has happened. And this is a real problem. Right here on my MacBook right now, I have six meticulously documented cases with names, addresses, everything the police need to go prosecute a case. And I'm just waiting for something to happen. Um, you know, this is a bigger problem about basically law enforcement not having anyone that's specifically responsible for responding to, you know, online threats with 15,000 FBI agents. By my best, as, as well as I understand it, there's no one out there whose job it is to prosecute this stuff. So, that's a real problem. For me personally, you know, I have 40,000 Twitter followers now. And ideal, it doesn't matter if I post a picture of my dog, I get screamed at all day long. Um, you know, last night I was giving a talk here, and we had someone come in and kind of interrupt the talk in a very aggressive way. Um, I'm constantly sealing about this stuff. So, you know, this is the really big, this is the biggest thing that's happened to me. I mean, Gamergate ostensibly is about journalism, ethics, and journalism. So, Newsweek did a story that they actually tried to tried to find out what Game of Day was actually working to accomplish. So there's Zoe Quinn, and Nina Sarkeesian, and me. Um, this is Steven Sotillo, who is editor-in-chief of um, Kotaku. And here's Kotaku. So what are Game of Day people actually talking about? Are they talking about journalistic ethics? No, they are attacking the new Sarkeesian and me. So this is a study Newsweek did that actually analyzed all of her tweets and found I'm one of the most harassed women on the entire internet. So yeah, that has a huge consequence on this. Um, you know, behind the scenes, I'm working my best to get changes made. Uh, you know, I talk to Twitter constantly, Reddit constantly, working with Congress, trying to get like new laws passed. You know, as for us, we're going to like keep developing games. That's where we're going to go. Why is this dealing with gamer game worth it? Financially, it wasn't. It's delayed our ability to put products out the door. It's cost me sleep. It's cost me sanity. But for me, personally, was it worth it standing up to this? I think that, I think that most people 
when they see something being wrong, they choose to not say anything. And for me, I had to stand up and do something. I, I couldn't have lived with myself if I'd sat down while all my friends were getting run out of the field. And just to tell you a bit about my personality and background, I grew up in Mississippi, in a state that was famously described as sweltering with the heat of oppression. And what I saw there every single day was ridiculous amounts of, of racism there. Um, you know, even growing up there in the 80s and 90s, like, you know, this is a, a culture that was very segregated still. You know, my high school in the late 90s had a segregated prom, guys. Like, white people went to one prom and black people went to another. So, you know, I've been used to seeing people just choose to say nothing. This is one of the more infamous events in Mississippi where three civil rights workers were just murdered by um, Mississippi police. You know, this is the school I personally went to, the University of Mississippi. James Meredith uh, incident was a riot in 1962 when um, black people tried to enter the university. And if you look at those columns in the back to this day, you can see bullet holes there from the riot that happened afterwards. This is all this today, when I was there. What happens in the same spot that James Meredith incident happened? A bunch of Southerners go get drunk as anything with the ball games. And you try to talk about the problems that exist in Mississippi culture, and people just shut down emotionally. They don't want to talk about it, they think it's a problem that's solved, and they just want to move on. The exact same play in game day. People just don't want to talk about it, they think women can do anything intellectually, they don't want to you know, analyze the systematic problems that we have in our industry. The truth is we have to have feminist critics in video games. This is from Soul Calibur. This is Ivy. Anyone can look at the way that she famously represented in this game and see it's problematic. But the honest truth is this is the rule of how women are represented in games rather than the exception. And 49% of the audience are women nowadays. We've got to get past this. Now, I'm not saying you can't show the soul caliber, but what we've got to have is some games that are made for a different audience, and we've got to talk about this kind of representation of women. Because the truth is, when you're consuming this kind of media all the time, it affects you. So, yeah, this is where it comes down to Giant Space Cat. Um, you know, am I going to stay in the industry, or am I leaving? And I was thinking about the scene from Aliens with uh, you know, Corporal Hicks, and he you has know, half his face melted off of acid, and he just looks at Ripley and says, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel every day. So I'm not going anywhere. This is where we're going to throw it up to questions. So do we have time? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that I think that by talking about it, it's finally in the consciousness of people. And I think the irony is by being so awful, people get pushed it to the point where we can't ignore it any further. So my message to your friend is, we're going to make it that important. And tell her to contact me. I will talk to any woman in this field and give her the emotional support that I can. I think we've got to stick together. So we're going to make it better for your friend. I absolutely promise you. Do you have more questions? Yes. Randy Parker. Uh, Love her. Yeah, she put out a tool called the Good Game Auto Blocker for Twitter that automatically blocks the majority of no gamer game Twitter apps. Yes. Mark Kearns came out and he suggests that this ban, um, oh, that the tool be banned, and then we sue Randy Parker for defamation, suggesting that lumping all gamer gates together implies that they are all misogynistic harassers. Have you used this tool? Do you think it's effective? It feels to me like maybe it's more of a band-aid than a solution. I, I think that what happens with the, the men that do this is they are incapable of understanding their harassers. They are incapable of understanding what the costs are of this. It feels like a free speech issue to them. 
And what they're unable to understand is it affects me personally, psychologically, and people screaming at me all day long. I don't use Randy Harper's blocker tool because I have to know when people want to murder me. Like, that's a survival mechanism. So I actually pay someone to go through my Twitter and to get through all that sewage. Is it a band-aid? Yes. But, you know, engineers work with what the tools that we have. As far as Mark Kerr, um, you know, I have a professional policy to not attack people in the industry. So he's also CEO of the company. I'm not going to go after him. I would say I personally don't feel like that case has any merits whatsoever. And I think it's, I think it's frankly a little childish. So um, what he said, it's about the CEO. So also love Randy. She's my friend's uh, daughter. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Do we have more questions? Yes. Um, when this first came out, I was very shocked that nobody was talking about it. Yeah. And I brought this up in my women's status class. And they were like, oh, it's just video games. <laughs> so what I find is that it's very interesting how many young women don't find it important anymore. Right. They're like, well, and I had this talk with my daughter. She's about to be 17. Oh. And she's like, well, we can do anything now, Mom. Yes, your grandmother had 90% less freedom than you do, but that 90% right. isn't even halfway sure. to where to total equality. Right. And um, how do you feel, younger girls? In the, do you feel they are that naive still? I, I think that it takes a while to develop feminist consciousness, and I think there are some of these lessons you don't learn until you get out in the workplace and have a business meeting and watch a man staring at your program and you know, I think there's some things you just have to get out there to work. Like, I'm sorry, you guys are in college right now, you're gonna change in the next decade. Once you get out there, your opinions are gonna change on this stuff. So, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge anyone for not getting it yet, and you know, their experiences with their experiences. Um, I'd say it's not just video games, then. I mean, something, you know, I talked about this a bit, but you know, software engineering, engineers, very generally speaking, build society. You know, engineers build the aqueduct. Engineers build our water systems, our sewer systems. You know, engineers build this building. Engineers build the things that society to use. And women are shut out of software engineering right now. We're shown the door. This has terrible consequences for the rest of the women that have to live in these spaces. I don't know about you guys, I spend a lot more time on Twitter than I do at my local civic center. So, um, you know, women, Working in games is a question of women get to have a hand in shape in the future. So I think it's terribly important. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? No. What kind of legislation are you trying to get passed in Congress? So what, um, what I specifically want is, again, I'm an engineer, so I'm a pragmatist. I want to work with the system I have. Um, these things are clearly illegal. Um, you know, uh, Danielle Citron is one of the most famous legal scholars on this issue, so she can look at the actual law and say what they're doing is clearly against the law. And the problem is there's no law enforcement whose job it is to adjudicate these cases. So all I'm looking for is for law enforcement to have some branch that's specifically tasked with prosecuting these things that are already illegal, which is pretty straightforward. So the FBI has 15,000 agents, I'd like 10 to work on prosecuting this stuff, which seems pretty reasonable it to me. It seems to me that if, it's a, if it dealt with property, then they'd be there in two seconds. Absolutely. If it dealt with money, they'd be there in two seconds. Absolutely. But um, a dozen people in their right. lives uh, and, 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 and it, other it, Your cases of having these cases, your chances of having these cases prosecuted are really low. Um, one legal study showed that between um, that there were only 10 cases of incidents being prosecuted in the last three years out of an estimated 2.5 million. So your chances, if you threaten someone, chances are very good that nothing's going to happen. So I think we just need, you know, we need people to prosecute these crimes. Let's do two more questions and we'll do it. Yes? Being a law enforcement officer and you know, I don't understand why cases aren't being prosecuted. We get kids on campus sure. that are threatened through internet or through um, communications. We take it down to the prosecutor right. and something happens. I don't understand what state or is this happening in. 
think it's happening all over. It's interstate crime, which is another reason it's hard to prosecute. I think um, you know, district attorneys tend to, from, you probably understand this more than I do because you're actually in the field, but district attorneys um, prosecute cases they feel that they can win because it, it helps their prosecution record. So I think it's simply not a priority for them. Um, I couldn't help but note that um, you know, with uh, Ferguson, some people that threatened the police over Ferguson, um, they got arrested and prosecuted within hours. So, um, you know, I'm not saying in this case it shouldn't be prosecuted, but I'm saying the police make a priority of prosecuting what the police do. So, I think that part of this is just good old fashioned political pressure. And by, you know, exercising my right as a citizen on, you know, by writing articles and talking to my legislators and saying this is important, I have to politically pressure people to make it more of a priority. So, I mean, I would like to feel safe online for <laughs> you guys. So, let's do one last question. Do you think part of the problem is that every individual harasser thinks that they're the only one? Yes. Okay. I have 40,000 Twitter followers. Um, so, I can guarantee if you have an opinion that's angry against me, I've heard it probably 10 times a day already. So, um, yeah, the problem, I think Amina Sarkeesian said this best, where she said the people doing this don't see themselves as harassers. They see themselves as noble warriors. And, um, you know, they see themselves as fighting. They feel like they are the oppressors. They, they feel like they are oppressed, and they're incapable of understanding what the consequences are of their actions. And, you know, it's, it's just hugely problematic. So, yeah, like I said. I think, why don't we do one more question? Does anyone else have a question? All right, cool, we'll end it there. Thank you guys for coming today. <laughs>